welcome to the segment on protein accumulation myopathies. This is the first of two types of congenital myopathy that we'll be focusing in on. Our focus for the next two segments will be pretty similar. In this segment, we will briefly discuss the pathophysiology, patient presentation, workup, and treatment options for the two most common forms of protein inclusion myopathy. The term protein accumulation myopathy is pretty self-explanatory. A variety of identified mutations lead to misfolding of muscle proteins during synthesis that result in abnormal architecture. In some of these instances, it creates a sticky point that causes the protein subunits to polymerize inappropriately, similar to what we see with hemoglobin in sickle cell anemia. This results in protein aggregates, which may appear as filaments representing an organized polymerization or an amorphous blob of randomly combined proteins. One of the most prevalent classes of protein accumulation myopathy is nemelin rod myopathy. The name is derived from a Greek term, meaning thread-like, which describes aggregates of thread-like protein polymerization within the cytoplasm. A number of genetic mutations can lead to this type of manifestation, the most common being a mutation to the NEB gene found on the long arm of chromosome 2. This codes for nebulin, a protein associated with the thin filament of the sarcomere, which serves as a scaffolding protein for the myofibril and regulates the standardized length of each sarcomere. Another common mutation that can lead to nemelin rod myopathy is mutation to the ACTA1 gene, which codes for the alpha actinin found in skeletal muscle. As previously explained, certain mutations have a tendency to create sticky points on the protein, possibly through the replacement of a nonpolar amino acid subunit with a polar subunit. Whatever the case, the protein subunits will tend to aggregate together, forming an insoluble mass of protein filament. The degree to which this occurs depends on the specific mutation and will impact the severity of the condition. The presentation pattern will be highly dependent on the specific mutations causing the condition. Generally speaking, patients will present with some degree of muscle weakness. In more severe cases, presentation may occur very early on with myotonia or floppy baby syndrome and delays in reaching motor milestones and an inability to ambulate without assistive devices. In milder cases, symptoms may be very subtle and go undiagnosed until later in life. Patients may present with characteristic facial deformities due to facial muscle involvement, speech impairments due to bulbar muscle involvement, and skeletal deformities such as scoliosis due to postural muscle involvement. As with other muscle conditions, workup will typically start with blood work. This may show an elevation in creatine kinase, but this is not a consistent finding. EMG and MRI studies typically follow and may show indications of general muscle weakness, but with no confirmable diagnosis. For this class of diseases, muscle biopsies provide the definitive diagnosis. Light microscopy will reveal the presence of these protein aggregates in the cytoplasm, and immunohistochemistry may be employed to identify the specific protein responsible for the condition. Electron microscope studies may also provide additional information based on the geometry of the aggregates, which can better be observed under high magnification. The second class of protein accumulation myopathy we will address are the intranuclear rod myopathies. In the previous segment, we talked about how the congenital myopathies are a heterogeneous group with heterogeneity, and we get a better appreciation of this now. A moment ago, we discussed how mutations to ACTA1 gene can lead to nemelin rod myopathy. As it turns out, a separate mutation to this gene, as well as other genes, can also result in intranuclear rod myopathy. It's not entirely sure how this form of protein accumulation occurs, but it is believed to be due to mutations in cytosolic proteins that create an erroneous nuclear localization signal, which mistakenly targets the protein to the nucleus. This creates difficulties with the normal function for the myonucleus. Presentation for internuclear rod myopathies is similar to that for nemelin rod myopathy, although they tend to be less debilitating. For one, 
The protein aggregates with nemalin rod myopathy tend to accumulate between and within the myofibril complex, which is expected to have a dramatic effect on normal contraction, which would not be an issue with internuclear accumulations. Secondly, the multinuclear organization of the muscle fiber and the presence of satellite cells, which serve as a reserve source to new myonuclei, mean that damage to myonuclei are not as concerning as damage to other aspects of the muscle cell. The workup for intranuclear rod myopathies is almost identical to that seen for anemalin rod myopathy. Again, the muscle biopsy makes the diagnosis, but in this case, the protein aggregates are localized to the myonuclei instead of the cytosol. As is the case for the other myopathies we have discussed, there is no cure for the protein aggregate myopathies. Treatment is focused on preserving independence for the patient for as long as possible and prolonging life expectancy. That wraps up our discussion of protein accumulation myopathies. In the final segment, we will look at an additional class of congenital myopathy, the core myopathies.